Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Hell. All right, we're back for one of the last episodes of the Peak Human Podcast this year. I'm back in Hawaii working on the Food Lies film with my director and editor. We're doing a three-week intensive hackathon trying to get things going, make big progress in this film before we head out for Africa soon so we can get even better footage from where it all began. We're going to live with some hunter-gatherers, some tribes people have heard of, the Hadza, the Maasai, and a couple others. Really great stuff going on. Thanks for supporting the film. We're really trying to get it out there and make it as good as possible. It's just taking some time. We actually are uploading a update with my director, Jay, to the Food Lies YouTube channel. You can check that out. Just search for Food Lies on YouTube. And now onto this episode, we have Morley Robbins. Really interesting guy, very experienced in vitamins and minerals. He's been in the game for a long time, doing a lot of research, a lot of interesting stuff about the ins and outs of how these vitamins and minerals work in conjunction with each other and how important they are to our body and all of our systems. We get down deep into the mitochondrial level, really interesting stuff. So check it out. He has some slightly controversial views about vitamin D, but just know he does believe in vitamin D and getting it from the sun and getting it from food sources, just not into the supplementation part. And I guess he just thinks that we don't want super high levels pushed up falsely with supplementation. So check it out. A lot to learn here. But before we begin, I'll just do a few quick announcements about Nose to Tail and Sapien. That's how this podcast is powered. Don't take any outside funding, any outside money, any other products, just the ones we make ourselves. Nose to Tail, really great stuff coming out. The beef tallow body care, we're getting back in stock. We have a few left. I think you can still get them before Christmas. We just got soap back in stock. This is really great stuff made from beef tallow. You don't want to put anything on your skin that you wouldn't eat. You can eat our soap. You can eat our skin food. This is the body care stuff. You can eat the lip balm. We're making the deodorant and the hair product that's coming out soon. The biltong, that we have endless of. We're making it nonstop. That's a South African beef snack. It's way better than jerky. It's dried slowly at a low temperature for seven days instead of heated rapidly at a high temperature like beef jerky. No sugar, no funny stuff. All our seasonings, got the primal special back in stock. No sugar, no MSG, no funny business, just straight up herbs and spices. I use it at every meal, actually. (laughs) I'm back here in Hawaii eating some deer meat that my friend shot, and we're just spicing it up with some of these seasonings. If you can't get your own deer meat, you can get some grass-finished meat delivered to you, nosetail.org. We ship to the 48 states. We have the primal ground beef with all the organs mixed in. We have the high omega-3, low omega-6 pork and chicken, which is truly one of a kind. It'll help keep you in that low omega-6, omega-3 ratio like we were for all of history until all the crazy seed oils infiltrated us. Anyway, you can get all that at nosetail.org. Sapien.org is where we have our program and our tribe. The program is for people who are new to this and want to change their life and get really healthy and learn all the ins and outs. We have videos. Dr. Gary leads this course, all kinds of information there. We're having a special now until the end of the year. It's half off. Go to sapien.org. You can get it now for half price. And the tribe. The tribe, we have a few lifetime memberships left. This is really supporting everything we do here. We have a special area for members only. We do private calls. We have private question and answers. You get the bonus episodes of this podcast. You get the extended show notes and more. So check it out, saping.org and get all the new products at nosetail.org. And here we go with Morley Robbins. All right, we're here with Morley Robbins. How are you doing today? Doing great. Glad we're having a chance to have this conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. We had a nice talk a few weeks ago and got to cover some of this ground and now it's the real deal. So where do you like to start? You have a great view of health and nutrition that's a bit different from my other guests. And I think it's really important. But how do you describe uh, your view? (laughs) I affectionately refer to myself as a pre-med retread. And I grew up in a very sickly family. I mean, it was probably a pretty good representation of the Merck Manual. So I went well, tell to us what the Merck Manual is. The Merck Manual is the Bible that doctors use for evaluating disease or assessing mm-hmm. disease. And it's comprehensive, very thick document. It's been around for, I have a 100th anniversary edition that goes back into the uh, mid-1800s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a very 
exhaustive compilation of all of the, the disease that exists on the planet. What I tease people is, unlike the Bible that so many of us might know about, there's a good guy in the Bible. There is no good guy in the Merck Manual. The Merck Manual is the Bible of allopathic medicine. So there's no good guy there. That should be a clue that there is something missing in that whole paradigm. But I went to college thinking I wanted to be a doctor, and that was not in my fate. I didn't understand why I needed to know about the Doppler effect to be a surgeon. That made no sense to me at all. So I wasn't a good student. Let's just leave it at that, at least at that point in my life. And I chose to go into hospital management because if you can't be a doctor, you might as well boss them around and did that for about 12 years, then elected to become a hospital consultant and did that for 20 years. And what I was particularly good at was forecasting. I can see patterns in data. It's just, you know, one of the few gifts that I uh, was granted upon my arrival here. I began to question what was going on when, when I started doing a series of uh, forecasts for chronic disease back in the one time late 1980s, and then again in 2008. So there were tw studies about 20 years apart, and there was a dramatic change in the incidence of disease that was being forecast for 2025, 2030. And it was, quite honestly, it was frightening. And I decided then I, I didn't want to be on the sidelines anymore. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. The idea of being a wellness coach caught my eye, but I didn't know what that meant. And long story short, I developed frozen shoulder from pulling a suitcase behind my back for 20 years. My body said, we're done with that. And it forced me into thinking differently about what I could do. And for some reason, I began to gravitate to minerals, began to study minerals, especially magnesium. Then I gravitated to copper, only to find out it comes in two flavors, usable and unusable. And when it's usable, when copper is usable, it regulates iron. Well, if you don't regulate iron, you got a problem, especially on this planet, because there's a lot of oxygen in the air and a lot of oxygen in our body that apparently no one thinks about. It's, we're talking about iron is the master pro-oxidant, master oxidizing element on the planet. And oxygen is the second most reactive element on the planet after fluoride. Mm. That's an interesting juxtaposition of uh, reactants. Rust, and so, right? Rust, absolutely. And so we've been conditioned to recognize a rusty nail, a rusty pipe, a rusty car, but completely ignore the fact that that same rusting process is what causes our aging. This isn't my idea. There's some incredibly gifted physicians and physiologists and iron biologists that have been studying it for decades. And Everything really changed as it relates to this whole study of uh, what's called the free radical theory of aging. So when we have oxygen and we have an accident with oxygen, it's called an oxidant, and it's also called a free radical. It's very reactive. It, it can bounce off and cause a lot of disruption to fats, membranes, DNA, things like that. And a industrial engineer by the name of Denham Harmon was in his 30s studying oxidative stress in the industrial setting, and he was intrigued by it. And he thought, I wonder if the same process was taking place in humans. So he decided to go to medical school and ended up at a little school named Stanford, mm -hmm. got his MD degree there. And in 1956, he published what's called the free radical theory of aging, which put the allopathic system on its ear because that was pulling the curtain back to reveal what's really going on in the aging process. And he didn't get a lot of traction with that until a very important discovery was made at Duke University in 1969 by Joe McCord and his faculty advisor, Erwin Fredovich. And they discovered what's called the enzyme called superoxide dismutase. Well, what is superoxide? It's an oxygen molecule with an extra electron, and it's really reactive. And it's like, instead of calling children hyperactive, we should call them superactive, because that's really what they are. They're just bouncing around. They, they can't calm down. Well, that's superoxide. And dismutase is just a goofy way of saying neutralize. And so this enzyme 
goes back to the beginning of oxygen on the planet. So about two and a half billion years ago, when oxygen first appeared on the planet, that's a that could be a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but when superoxide dismutase was identified, it validated Denim Harmon's theory, and it put that whole concept into play. And now the free radical theory of aging is the most accepted and most adopted theory of aging on the planet. Not without gnashing of teeth, not without beating of chest, because there are still clinicians and still scientists that want us to, to worship at the altar of Louis Pasteur. And for the listeners that don't know this, mm -hmm. Louis Pasteur was a fraud. He got his PhD from a correspondence program. Mm -hmm. And in 1995, a famous medical historian evaluated all 10,000 pages of his work. That's a lot of pages. Mm. And there was an article written up in the New York Times back when that was an accepted journalistic paper that was telling the truth back then. And the headline read, Pasteur was a fraud. And that Pasteur, of course, is all about the infamous particle that invades our body that takes control. We know it today as COVID-1984. And Pasteur had a nemesis. He had an arch rival. And his name was Antoine Béchamp. Mm -hmm. And Antoine Béchamp was the most decorated scientist of his day. He had an MD degree and two earned PhDs, was the most decorated scientist in all of Europe. And what Béchamp was talking about was the field. Pasteur was particle, Béchamp was field. And Béchamp was saying, what's changed in the field to allow this particle to take over? The damage. What's me, happened to the body? What's happened, what's happened to, to the, uh, the humans? Yes. Exactly. And so it took me years, Brian, to figure out what he meant by field. And it's the bioenergetic field of the human, just as you're alluding to. And so we have a force field. We have a vibration. And when that vibration isn't right, it allows the, the particles to begin to take control. And so we have a classic case of yin and yang, good and bad, you know. And so the body, what's fascinating, one of the real upsides of, of 2020 is it inspired me to understand how does the immune system really work? Not this pasture-esque, oh my God, run in fear, your immune system isn't strong enough. And guess what? It runs on energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole cell immune system, the whole innate immune system, it's incredibly dependent on energy. And You've heard of that famous formula, E equals MC squared, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. People can recite it. They can say, oh, it's energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. But we don't know what that really means. But what occurred to me as I was doing this studying this year is it means energy equals structure times function. And when there's a change in the mineral inputs into the system, you don't put out as much energy, especially in the mitochondria. If the mitochondria can't make energy for the T cells, the B cells, the natural killer cells, the macrophages, there's just rampant confusion in the body. And the role that bioavailable copper plays to ensure our not just our intelligence, but our resilience to attack is nothing short of a miracle. And none of that is being discussed in mainstream mm. media or mainstream medicine. It's all about the booga wooga bug. And nothing about who's talking about immunocompetence? Who's talking about immunometabolism? Anybody? No, there are very few because it begins to destroy the narrative of the booga wooga bug. I've been banging on about this the entire time. All the great people and other doctor friends I have in this great. space are as well. One guy in the mainstream was Bill Maher, of all people, was mm -hmm. talking about it. He kept asking, I shared a lot of his videos, like, why is no one talking about health, immune system, better food? No one has mentioned it once. Not one politician has mentioned it once. It's insane. <laughs> and also, we're going to talk about the mitochondria. I'm wearing a mitochondria shirt. You can see that. If you're looking, <laughs> if you're watching uh, the video version of this, uh, I don't usually do a lot of YouTube video versions, but we're doing this on video and you can see my mitochondria shirt. But uh, mitochondria is the base of energy and yep. we'll get into that and copper and um yeah you're talking about the germ versus terrain which Absolutely. is i guess people know it as and yeah, i've alluded to that here and there but we've never gotten super into it and, and some guests have 
talked about that, right? And, and everyone listening knows or agrees with this terrain theory that we are the terrain, we have control, right. this is our body. And I always talk about how I haven't gotten the flu, I haven't got any sickness in five years since I started changing my diet, but it's come my way. I used to know when I get sick. When I was in college, every year around finals, when I wasn't sleeping, I was not eating right, I was stressed right. out, and I get yeah. sick. Yeah. It's like it's not like I magically got this bug right when it was floating around just during finals week. It didn't know when finals week was. So it, you just didn't have the energy to fight it off. Exactly. So let's get into that. So maybe you can start with the immune system because that's a hot topic these days. And you mentioned adaptive, innate. Well, let's just it, jump into that. Yeah. So there's a very important article written by Dr. Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S. He works in Austria when he was in his prime. He was working with a guy named Gunther Weiss, W-E-I-S-S. Gunther Weiss's team in Austria probably are some of the brightest people on the planet as it relates to understanding iron and understanding the immune system. And there's an article by Dr. Fuchs talking, and this was in 1998, talking about the iron recycling system under immune activation. And it's, again, what you have to understand is that the response of our terrain, as you call it, this is a conserved response over billions of years. Again, that the, the, there was something called the great oxygen event when oxygen began to have a bigger presence on the planet. And when there was one-tenth of 1%, now we have 21% oxygen in the air. But when it was one-tenth of 1%, it wiped out 99% of life on the planet, which means that everything was anaerobic for the most part. And so our biology is designed to manage iron and oxygen at all costs. Because it's when those two, when you, when you start to create rust, as you noted, it's very bad for the biology. And what most people don't realize is that for whatever reason, it's, it's absolutely amazing, but copper is the only element on planet Earth that can work with oxygen cleanly and can regulate iron cleanly without any static. It's the only element. And isn't it interesting that it has a principal role in managing energy in your t-shirt, your mitochondria, but those mitochondria are found in the immune system. Macrophages run on mitochondria. T cells, B cells, natural killer cells all run on mitochondria. Neutrophils, 70% of our lymphocytes are called neutrophils. And there's a condition called neutropenia. You've probably have heard of it, but maybe you didn't know it's, it's a clinical sign of copper deficiency. Mm. And so in my world, what has happened is we've been programmed to believe that we are anemic and we're copper toxic. Don't you know? You're anemic and you're copper toxic. And when you believe that, then you begin to eat foods that have a lot of iron in them and you'll do anything you can to chase copper out of your body, especially do coffee enemas or whatever you can to just wipe out the copper because you, you know it's bad. And it turns out that that meme that runs most of society is a lie. And the truth is we are iron toxic iron is stuck in our cells and there's compelling literature and research about that and we have a whisper of copper over the last century of efforts by the farming system the food processing system and big pharma to basically turn us into copper deserts and most people don't know that they don't understand the central role that bioavailable copper plays to run those mitochondria on your t-shirt and then subsequently run the immune system. And again, this isn't my idea. You know, Joseph Prohaska, who's a distinguished uh, professor of, of um, copper and iron at the University of Minnesota in Duluth, uh, Susan Percival, Dr. Bonham in, in France, and there are many others, have been studying the central role that copper plays in ensuring innate immunity. And if we don't have the ability to create energy, which then allows us to create intelligence and resilience, well, then we have a problem. And that's, you're talking about the importance of diet and the importance of sleep. Again, what you want to do is lower the, the chronic stress in your life, you know, have a better diet, get more sleep, have fewer emotional challenges in your world, have fewer financial crises in your world. But the other side of it is making sure that you're getting the nutrients that are so important 
to run the mitochondria, run the signaling system, run the immune system. And most people don't realize that minerals are the keys to start the engine. I think, unfortunately, a lot of practitioners think of minerals as hood ornaments. Oh, aren't they cute? Isn't that a fun little symbol? As opposed to, well, actually, it's the it's what starts the enzymes, which are the engines that run our body. And so, you know, an example would be a lot of people are familiar with magnesium. And that's the mineral that I cut my teeth on. And for the longest time, I thought it was just take some more magnesium and you'll solve all your problems and discovered that wasn't the case. But magnesium back in um, 2012 was redefined in terms of what's called the magnesome. You know, all of the components of the DNA that are dependent on magnesium for protein generation. Well, it's 3,752 enzymes that are dependent on magnesium. Well, that begins to paint a very different picture. That's that's 40% of your enzyme family. And so it's the equivalent, when you're magnesium deficient because you're not getting sleep, you're eating a lousy diet, you're worrying about your grades in school and worrying about the next exam you've got, your magnesium burn rate is so accelerated and you're not aware of it. And then suddenly it's like you lose your arm and your leg. That's about 40% of your body weight. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to get around with just one leg and one arm, right? So people don't think of it in those terms. And what took me a number of years to finally piece together is that when you begin to introduce the dynamic between copper and iron, and they're duking it out all day long over oxygen, and we know that iron is very important to carry iron, excuse me, carry oxygen, it's a waiter. Hemoglobin is a waiter carrying oxygen. And that's where 70% of your iron in your body goes into hemoglobin. Another 10% is in myoglobin in our muscles. Again, storing oxygen when we need it. So that's 80% of our iron is just a waiter. But no one's ever thought about, well, who's the chef who's slicing and dicing the oxygen so we can make energy, so we can clear up the exhaust, so we can combat enemies? Well, the chef turns out to be copper. And so that whole concept of, well, there's waiters and there's a chef, We've never thought about it in biological terms, but there really is. And what's happened in the modern era is we have too many waiters and we don't have enough chefs. Mm-hmm. Again, not my idea. I'm just, I'm just sharing the, the information that I've gleaned over reading 5,000 articles over the last 11 years. And the information's there. I can guarantee your listeners that. Yeah, I agree. And I want to make sure people aren't scared away from eating foods because some people are would think, oh, wait, now I can't eat liver because this it has iron, but you are a big fan of eating liver. And so, so maybe you can clear up some of this stuff. And also my audience is really into, you know, bioavailability of foods. And, you know, right. we know a lot about that. So maybe you can go into that. Absolutely. So the, it's all about understanding. A good thing to understand is we are what we eat eat, eats, and can assimilate. Mm. So what it really comes down to is, what's the soil eating? What are the microbes, the ribosomes, eating to put the minerals into the root system that are going to go into plants, that might go into animals, that might go into our body? And so it's very important in regenerative farming, as you know, to understand how do we restore mineral balance in the soil? And the number one nutrient deficiency on the farm for the last 60 years has been copper deficiency. Most people don't know that. And it's only getting worse with the increased use of uh, Roundup because Roundup is a copper chelator. I mean, it it messes up a lot of minerals, but the one... Magnesium is a problem too, right? Magnesium is a problem. Manganese is a problem. But a big fan of Stephanie Seneff, and I was at a conference a couple years ago and we were at a breakfast table and she leaned over and she said, Morley, do you want to know why glyphosate is so toxic to copper? And I was like, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Mm-hmm. And so what I learned and did not know is that glyphosate can chelate copper down to a pH of one. That means that nothing can stop glyphosate from chelating copper. And what's a new concept for your listeners is that the reason why we're here The reason why you and I are having this engaged conversation, working with these fancy pieces of equipment, 
is because of the intellect that is born from energy from the mitochondria in the neurons that allowed us to think. And all of that is possible because of copper. And the dependence that the mitochondria have on copper supersedes anything that people realize. They have no idea how copper-driven those little organelles are. And this idea of mitochondrial dysfunction, no, it's copper deficiency. I can confidently say that. And so the issue is very important that farmers understand that copper is under the biggest attack. Very important that people realize that there are very rich sources of, of copper in the food system. Bee pollen is, I, mean, I have this in my, what's called my root cause protocol, but you can't pollinate a flower and you can't pollinate an animal without copper. It's well chronicled in the literature because of its antioxidant role. And so bee pollen has a bunch of B vitamins, but also has copper. Real vitamin C, as opposed to ascorbic acid, they're very different. And I think your listeners probably know that. But real vitamin C has an engine. And that engine is called tyrosinase. And the tyrosinase enzyme has two coppers in it. And if your listeners think that it just has to do with skin color and eye color and hair color, then I've got a bridge and a used BMW. I'd love to sell them because it's one of the most important enzymes in the human body. It's particularly important for thyroid function, but we can get into that in a later discussion. So tyrosinase, real vitamin C, and people are going to be quick to say, oh, well, I'll just eat more, I'll eat more oranges. Well, have you talked to the citrus farmer to see how they are treating the soil to make sure that there really is enough vitamin C, enough copper getting into that tree to get into the fruit. Vitamin C's potency is a function of copper. It's absolutely very central to its um, activity. And then a, another wonderful source, as you've mentioned, is beef liver, grass-fed beef liver. Mm -hmm. Why does it have to be grass-fed? Guess what? Guess what's in that grass? <coughs> Vitamin C. How about that? And so there's copper in that grass that gets into the animal's liver. And Who's a great uh, example of, of being a great grass farmer? Joel Shallotton. He's the quintessential grass farmer, right? He loves to hold up his bouquet of grass. Well, it's just teeming with nutrients, but it's teeming with vitamin C. And so what most people don't realize is that a healthy liver from a cow has twice as much copper as it has iron. And so our livers are really designed to store copper and retinol, and under certain conditions, it will store iron as well. But we have been programmed over the last probably 50 to 70 years to believe that liver equals iron, and they've expunged retinol and copper from, the, um, from our, our language and our, our awareness. It's crazy. Also, Joel Salt and I had him on the show about a month ago, so people oh, very cool. to that one, yeah. I made a pilgrimage to uh, Polyface Farms many years ago. I just wanted to pay homage to the, the significance of what that farm represents. Yeah, I was there as well. I've been, we filmed uh, for Food Lies. But, um, but yeah, keep going with this. And so it's important for the individuals to understand that you want to have a natural diet. You want to have nutrient-dense food. You want to have what I call an ancestral diet. I think the best depiction of it would be what Weston A. Price just studied back in the 1920s. And he chronicled why it was so important, put a lot of emphasis, obviously, on retinol. I don't think he was as crisp on minerals as he could have been, but maybe it was just because of limitations of time, testing, what have you. Uh, that he just wasn't aware of that. But, but copper would have been, I think if he had understood copper, the impact of the Western A price movement would be even greater. Well, yeah, he didn't even know what vitamin K2 was. He called it activator X. And so there were exactly. some limitations, but he did bring back a lot of the food and back to Ohio and did whatever he could in the lab and found that it was something like 10 to 20 times more uh, rich in vitamins and minerals. That's right. Than Absolutely. our food. I think it was tenfold greater in fat soluble vitamins and fourfold greater in minerals or something to mm, that effect. But, yeah. but huge differences. 
And yet we've been raised in a country that places no value on nutrient density. My uh, brother-in-law was a uh, beef farmer, grass-fed, went out of his way to make sure they were eating grass the way they were supposed to. But guess what? There was no incremental benefit to him in selling the beef cattle with grass because when they bought the cattle, they didn't care. Mm. And so, again, if he had gone out to a farmer's market, he could have made a premium, but he wasn't willing to expend the energy to do that. But in the commercial system, there's no difference given between uh, grain-fed versus grass-fed, which is an abomination to not just the animal's metabolism, but our metabolism. And so it's, I think people may not fully understand how important it is to understand the challenges that these farmers are under, but make sure that they are inspired to feed the soil and make sure the animals are being fed properly as well. And animals are really smart. If they're given a choice between GMO food and, and real food, they will always eat real food. They'll never eat, they'll never touch the synthetic stuff. And so it's just, we live in a, a world now where we're supposed to believe that synthetic is the same thing as real. And, and you and I know that, and listeners know that, but it's like most of the people we associate with think they're one and the same, that the plastic dashboard on their car is the same as a wood dashboard, and, and we know it's not. I love this topic because I've been getting into the supplementation. I'm trying to write an article about it. Just a high level of our view of supplementation in the medical literature is mixed and isn't so great. And I, I think it's for a reason. So we think that vitamins and minerals aren't that important. This is my theory. We think that they're not important because when we isolate them in a synthetic form and exactly. supplement them, they don't work that well. And we have these studies, but it's not because vitamin D is not good. It's because you can't just isolate it and give it to people in a exactly. vacuum. Exactly. And the tragedy is you take a, your typical one a day vitamin. Again, everything in there is synthetic. Let's start there. And then the ratio of calcium to magnesium, always two to one. And what Dr. Dye at Vanderbilt University proved 10, 15 years ago is magnesium has always got to be twice calcium in order to be absorbed. So as soon as you've got calcium two to one, you're not getting any magnesium. You've got way too much zinc to the copper, way too much iron to the copper. All the B vitamins are synthetic. You know where those B vitamins are coming from? Coal tar derivatives, and the listeners can have a field day studying coal tar derivatives. They claim that they are composed of 10,000 elements, and they have names for 5,000 of them. I find that very funny. How do they know there's another 5,000 that they can't name? But it's like, whatever. The point is, they're really toxic. And then they get into all these other uh, micronutrients, and people don't realize that, that that concoction creates so much confusion in our livers in our digestive tract, in our kidneys, in our gallbladders. And it's just, and so in the same vein that the free radical theory of aging is the most accepted theory to explain aging, there's a, a parallel movement that downplays the role of antioxidants. Antioxidants don't work. Well, the reason why they don't work is they're the synthetic forms of them. They're not the real natural forms that our ancestors were raised on. And so they've biased the the uh, studies to say, well, the antioxidants just don't seem to work. They're not neutralizing the the oxidants. They're not neutralizing the free radicals. And it's like, how could you possibly do that if you don't have the right kind of nutrients? And one of the most interesting studies I came across was a study comparing real vitamin E complex. So it has four tocopherols and four tocotrines and selenium at its core. And they were comparing the antioxidant capacity of that nutrient to three different chemotherapy drugs. And they had to stop the study when they came to realize that the vitamin E was outperforming the three chemotherapy drugs combined. Wow. So, But when people go to their health food store and get vitamin E, all they're getting is alpha tocopherol. They don't know they're not getting the whole complex. Why do you think they would only sell the alpha tocopherol? Because it's, in, it's completely incompetent without the other components of the vitamin E molecule. That's the game that, that Big Pharma plays in making these nutrients because 95% of the supplements that are available on the market are controlled by Big Pharma. And what people haven't taken the time to think about is, let's see, so I could stop a disease by using a supplement 
and that would put Big Pharma out of business. Well, that's not going to happen. They're going to sell you a watered down version, call it something that makes it sound like it's really powerful, has no impact, so they can sell their drugs later in your life. And most people don't realize that that's the game that's being played between uh, big pharma drugs and big pharma supplements. I'm kind of trying to expose that on this podcast and in the film. There's a whole sordid history of this and with the allopathic medicine model and how all the natural forms of medicine were suppressed and there's some big interests involved, some big names that people may have heard of that uh, have, have a lot of money and a lot of power over the years and have tried to make this happen. It's actually pretty sinister. There's no money in healthy people, period. Yeah. And there's no money in, there's no money in dead people but there's a lot of money in sick people. That's the society. And that's what I began to realize when I was doing these forecasts. It's like, wait a minute, society is becoming chronically ill and it's out of control. And I just said, there's gotta be a way. And so the two questions that drove my original research were, why is everyone so sick today? And the other is, how is anemia possible? It's the number one condition on the planet. Iron deficiency anemia, wink, wink, is the number one nutrient deficiency on planet Earth. Let's step back and think about that. So iron is the number one element on planet Earth. 36% of the Earth's composition is iron. There's nothing any higher than that. And last time I checked, Homo sapiens were the most evolved species. We could argue that for a while if we wanted, especially mm -hmm. in the year of 2020. Mm -hmm. but, but again, we've got number one element, smartest species, and the smartest species has lost the natural ability to metabolize the number one element on the planet. That doesn't pass the sniff test. That told me there was something missing, and it turns out that every facet of iron metabolism is copper dependent, and that's, it's in the literature. It's absolutely chronicled in the literature back in the 1920s, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and then it changed. And in the 70s, suddenly there's no mention of copper running the iron metabolism. So that's the start of where the, the crisis is. And we were taught to worship at the altar of iron. Do not speak of copper. It's, it's akin to Voldemort. And doctors don't know what ceruloplasmin is. They don't know what the ferrooxidase enzyme is. They don't know what superoxide dismutase is. They don't know what glutathione peroxidase does. And these are the backbone of our immune system because that's how oxidants get neutralized. And it's pathetic. I call it allopathetic, that the, some of the brightest people on the planet don't understand oxygen metabolism, don't understand mineral metabolism, and don't understand energy metabolism. And they don't understand the mechanics that go into that t-shirt you're wearing, which are nothing short of a miracle. And what's amazing is that the the little organelles called mitochondria have a, a really funky swimming pool in the center. It's called the matrix. Yeah, it's called the matrix. Well, very talented uh, copper researcher, Paul Cobine, who did his doctoral dissertation at the University of Saskatchewan and is now based at University of Auburn, very smart guy. He figured out that it's actually a matrix copper pool. The swimming pool has a bunch of copper in it, and it's 50,000 atoms of copper in that pool that runs the mitochondria. There are five complexes in the mitochondria. The first four are called the electron transport chain, and when it's hooked up to complex five, it's called oxidative phosphorylation, all sorts of fancy nomenclature. But the bottom line is complex one, complex four, and complex five are copper dependent. Turns out that in the plant world, complex three is copper dependent, but there's no literature in the human world. But then you have to ask yourself, wow, that must mean that complex three is really important. Where's all the oxidative stress getting created? 90% of it's being created in our mitochondria at complex one and complex three. Wow, so if you don't have copper there, Think that might increase the amount of oxidative stress? Of course it does. And as soon as oxygen isn't being handled properly in the mitochondria, you can't make water. And if you can't make water, you can't release the energy precursor molecules called ADP, which go over to complex five, 
to become ATP. And actually, technically, that molecule is spelled magnesium hyphen ATP because the body doesn't recognize energy unless it's got a magnesium ion. And it can't use it without the magnesium ion. Those are important, niggly little facts, aren't they? And that's not taught in doctor school. But I think it's fascinating that one of the world-renowned authorities on metabolism, is his name is Douglas Wallace. He's a geneticist at uh, CHOP, Children's Hospital, Pennsylvania. And he's the guy that figured out that it was the mitochondrial DNA that passed from mother to child. Pretty smart guy. He'll, he'll eventually get a Nobel Prize for that. But he also talks about the failure of modern medicine to understand energy deficiency. And because they don't understand equals MC squared, and they don't understand that when energy deficiency takes hold of a cell's function, that the structure and function of the cells start to change. And then over a course of time, it's going to begin to change the physiology and the function of the tissue. And this is whether we're talking about atherosclerosis, multiple sclerosis, cancer, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, arthritis, it doesn't matter. It, at a cellular level, it's the exact same process. It's just different cells involved in different body parts. But they've all got to be able to make energy, and they can't make energy if they can't turn oxygen into water. And it's the most basic aspect of life on planet Earth, for the mammals anyway. I love this stuff. And I love that you say that there is no disease. Do you want to explain that? Because it's got all tying this stuff in. Absolutely. So it's really funny, Brian, when I first said it, I took a big gulp thinking there was just going to be this big mm. you know, blowback, not one peep. I took the stand about three or four years ago. There is no disease. There is only metabolic dysfunction that's caused by mineral dysregulation that changes molecular dynamics. And when people understand the patty cake function of what are called reduction oxidation chemical transactions in the body. It's where electrons are being passed back and forth to allow things to take place. It's called redox. And that's what runs our body. And when you understand that pathogens emit oxidants and then they need to be neutralized and that, that all the pathogens trying to do is survive, I mean, isn't that what we're all trying to do? And what's really important is that all pathogens, virtually all pathogens, I'm sure there's some listeners who are going to thump me in the nose about Lyme disease, but virtually all pathogens live, replicate, and thrive on an iron buffet. And a number of years ago, a couple of years ago, I had a distinguished opportunity to talk to Douglas Kell, who's one of the world's authorities on iron. He's at University of Manchester, and he's got, instead of having a, a funky picture behind him, he's got this wall of books. And uh, at my age, very affable guy. And he said, this was the start of the conversation. He said, Morley, I want you to know that I really enjoyed your My Theory of Everything video. I said, you watched it? He said, oh, yeah. He said, it's quite good. I thought you did a nice job. You could have kind of brushed me off with a feather at that point. He said, but what I really want to do is put you at rest. You're spot on about pathogens living and thriving on iron. And most people don't know that. And most people don't know that the particles that Pasteur was so obsessed with live on iron. And most people don't know that the immune system thrives on copper. And so I gave a talk back in March as, as the COVID engine was beginning to unfold. It's a YouTube video that people can look up. And I talk about three words, fear, I spell it differently, F-E hyphen A-R. Cure, I spell it differently, C-U hyphen R-E. And love. And people just, and faith. People just need to, you know, love and faith. People just need to know that the origin of a lot of their unrest is fear-based. And the solutions for all the conditions that we're faced with in, in the course of our lives are dependent on energy, which is dependent on bioavailable copper. It's a very simple model that begins to basically pull the curtain back on the, the pathogens and say, well, now that I know you're living on iron, I can begin to deal with that. And there's a really important clinical study by Dr. Paracone from Italy in 2020, March of 2020. 
And he decided to take a very innovative approach to curing COVID. Instead of worrying about vitamin D and azithromycin and all that stuff, he did chelation of iron. Boom, people got well mm. because he got rid of the real engine of, of SARS-CoV-2 is a cytokine storm whipped up by two responders to inflammation, the T cells and the macrophages, and they released chemicals called uh, cytokines. And the, the cytokine that's of most importance to macrophages is called tumor necrosis factor alpha. The cytokine that's most important to uh, T cells is called interferon gamma. And when they start to mix, things happen. Well, if there's overstimulation of that because of too much ferritin protein in the blood, it creates what's called a cytokine storm. Well, Dr. Perricone's smart guy. He knew that if I can lower the amount of iron in the body, I'm going to lower the amount of ferritin. And that's exactly what happened. And he was able to stop uh, COVID-2 or COVID-19 in his tracks. So again, people have been trained to think one way. And the danger that happens, particularly with practitioners, is practitioners confuse their training with the truth. And the truth is usually 180 degrees from the training. Uh -huh. Yeah, the training is a, another story. We need to go into the vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, stuff like that, because, <laughs> yeah, that is confusing people because the more holistic, natural, health, food, functional medicine community, these are known as great things. But we need to kind of figure out the difference between someone having low vitamin D because they have a messed up metabolism and, and their whole body is messed up. And you can't just throw some vitamin D on top of that. It's root cause, really. Like go into the root cause stuff about why it might not be good to just try to overdose on <laughs> vitamin C and vitamin D. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of cod liver oil and I'm a big fan of sunlight and a big fan of eating fish, which is probably, or, and any animal that's in sunlight is going to put vitamin D into mm -hmm. their product, whether it's chickens or pigs or fish pigs, or whatever. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm not, Brian, what I am anti is anti-supplement bottles. Yes, yes. That's okay. poison. That's poison. And what, what's difficult for most people to know is back in the 1920s, that's when retinol research, vitamin A, but retinol, that's when retinol research was at its peak. It was an unprecedented amount of research about retinol. That's what inspired Dr. Price was all this focus on retinol and how important it was. And so it's in the literature. What were they doing with vitamin D? They were throwing it in the garbage. I've seen that in, in print. We threw the vitamin D away because it had no metabolic value. So again, we have to be really careful about the era that we live in. What people don't know is there was a very important book written in 1948, and the title is called 1984. If people haven't read 1984, they should, because we are living it in 2020. And what is white is black, and what's black is white. It's very evident. And so there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of disinformation, there's a lot of confusion. And I'm a strong proponent of cod liver oil because it has 10 parts retinol, which I would regard as 100 times more important than vitamin D, and it has one part of vitamin D. And why is the D low? Because the inflammation is high. And what's the true metabolic cause of high inflammation? Low copper creates high iron, creates low magnesium. And what is very important to understand is that William Wiglicki, who's a famed researcher at uh, George Washington University, he cut his teeth in cardiology at a little school up in Boston called Harvard, and preeminent researcher at, at Harvard, and he started to connect magnesium deficiency to inflammation. And they kicked him out. They said, we don't like what you're saying. So he goes to George Washington University, and he was able to definitively prove that the cellular event that precedes inflammation is called magnesium deficiency. And so it's important for people to know that these minerals, they really do matter. And if the cell doesn't have access to these minerals, it will begin to initiate a change in structure and function. And what is inflammation? It's the second stage of oxidative stress. The first stage is called hypoxia. 
and then we have inflammation, and then the third stage is called cytotoxicity. It's just a, another way of saying cancer. And so as soon as the cells can't activate oxygen and turn it into water to release energy, then the tissue begins to gasp, begins to function differently because it doesn't have energy. And so that's where a lot of confusion is, is that people think that oxidative stress and inflammation are two different things. No, they're just derivatives of each other. Oxidative stress is a spectrum disorder. If we can't work with oxygen, it's going to start out as hypoxia, and then inflammation, and then cytotoxicity. And what is cancer? It's inflammation on steroids, because the body can't work properly with oxygen. Why? Because there's no bioavailable copper. And one of the evolving treatments for cancer now is to use iron chelation, just like Dr. Perricone did in Italy for COVID. Using iron chelation is a very effective way of treating cancer, but not a lot of oncologists know that. Interesting. I want to go back. So the body is this complex symphony of thing, enzymes and reactions and minerals and vitamins going on, and they need to be in the right bioavailable form and have all these things. And our modern food system has thrown that off. Our modern agriculture system has thrown right. that off. And you're saying if we eat natural foods, we're eating liver and animal foods and seafood and all these good things, we can get it back to normal. I'm still having trouble with this vitamin D thing. So people getting out in the sun, if you're doing it right, if you're getting the magnesium, I've seen a lot of good data on ancestral living people with high vitamin D because they're eating their natural diet and getting sun and it's a good thing. And, and then also you see in these COVID studies that people who are getting hospitalized and have the worst cases or deaths have the lowest vitamin D. So we're saying that's an indicator. What I was saying initially is it's an indicator of something's going wrong. So maybe try to explain it to me one more time. We don't have too much time, but just we're not saying vitamin D is bad. Or are you just saying we have the wrong paradigm that we need to just wrong. jack up our levels, falsely mm-hmm. jack up the levels? Your paradigm is missing retinol. Your paradigm is missing minerals, especially the dynamic, the very notable dynamic between magnesium and iron. As soon as iron is out of regulation, there's magnesium loss because iron creates oxidative stress. As you noted in the first few minutes of the conversation, it creates rust. What's creating rust in our body? We just didn't know it was called reactive oxygen species. So rusty oxygen species, let's call it that, so people understand what we're talking about. I'm not saying D is bad. I'm saying that D has been blown out of proportion in terms of its importance. There's no consideration to what retinol does in the body and how interdependent. So here's the part that most people are missing. The uh, vitamin D is faster than a speeding bullet. Vitamin D can leap tall buildings paradigm is based on active D, which is connected to the vitamin D receptor, which is regulated by RxR. That's where the power of vitamin D is expressed when those three are working together. Active D, vitamin D receptor, RxR. What is RxR? Retinoid X receptor that is only made possible through having retinol in your diet and having the capacity to conjugate retinol into those nuclear receptors that are profoundly important for physiology. Most people don't know that. And so we live in very simplistic times. D, good. D, good. Let's pull back the curtain. That's all I've done is pull back the curtain to say, why is D good? And it's good because it's in an active form and it's connected to vitamin D receptor and it's connected to RxR. When D is low, why is D low? Because inflammation is raging in the body. Why is inflammation raging? Because there's not enough copper that's causing iron to accumulate, which is causing magnesium loss, which is causing low production of the storage form. But again, we've got to get into the active form is where it's at. And so the paradigm needs to be taken up a notch from grade school thinking, D, good, to D is a function of variables, function of other minerals, function of how's the body performing, particularly in relationship to retinol. And again, as you've noted, the body, it doesn't work in micronutrients. It works in pairs. 
There's all sorts of sneeze cells in the body mm -hmm. that are highly interdependent and highly dependent on energy. And so, again, we're back to the mitochondria in your T-shirt. I've got to be in this dance. And where does the actual regulation of iron take place? It's taking place in the mitochondria. The iron has got to be turned into iron sulfur clusters and heme. And if the mitochondria don't have enough copper to do that, it starts to build in the mitochondria. And then the mitochondria start to lose energy. It's complex, but it's elegantly simple in terms of how the body really works. And it's highly dependent on having real food grown properly, in season, colorful food, food that is, for the most part, prepared. How many blenders did Dr. Price find on his mm -hmm. travels with his wife? Not many blenders. Mm -hmm. Those cooked food is, is what he was really advocating. And so... I think it's important for people to step back from the narrative and ask a few more questions. A good question to ask in this era is, why is this hyperbolic insistence on vitamin D supplements? Why aren't they telling people to get it through their food or through stimulation with the sun? I think it's a valid question. Why is this this constant push for more supplemental forms so there's a difference between sun-based D mm -hmm. versus soy-based lanolin D. It's, they're very different uh, chemicals, as you well know. And the form that's made from sunlight, as Stephanie Stennis will point out, it's sulfated. It's water-soluble. That's a really important thing to know. So water-soluble can, can go anywhere it's needed. The kind that comes in the supplement bottle is fat-soluble. Did you know that? And so there's a big difference between fat-soluble D getting stuck in your liver, and the water soluble that's sun-activated that can go anywhere the body needs it. That's interesting because usually the fat-soluble vitamins are better. No, I know, but, but that's the beauty of a sulfated vitamin D. And she's written a couple articles about this. I mean, again, it's just the tragedy is so many people have been educated by mainstream media and mainstream medicine what you and I are talking about as it relates to vitamin D, this is not taught in doctor school. They're just well, taught usually, D is good. D is good. Well, yeah, I mean, I haven't really even seen many mainstream people talk about D is good, really. They just say take drugs and do surgery. So only in the more functional medicine community do they even say D is good. So you're saying one step beyond that <laughs> is that we need to think about it in a different paradigm, which is fine. So we got to try to wrap it up here, but I'm kind of getting from you, I'll repeat it again, that there's these, all these vitamins and minerals are interdependent. It's this complex orchestra uh, in our body. And it's pretty simple that when we go away from that, our body is messed up. It's like a race car with a very specific fuel that it needs. And if everything's in the wrong proportions, the engine doesn't run right. So what do we need to eat? What are these bioavailable forms of copper? And what's sort of this high level view of what to eat? Yeah, so what I would encourage people to do who have an interest in what we're talking about, they can go to my website, um, rcp123.org. That stands for the root cause protocol, rcp123.org. You, In exchange for your email address, which we will honor, you can download a 32-page document that lays out what the root cause protocol is. And there's a series of stops and as a series of starts. One of the starts is eat real food, eat an ancestral diet. I'm a big fan of the Weston A. Price lifestyle because I think it's the closest thing that are, it comes to what our ancestors used to eat. I picture sitting down with my great-grandparents having a meal where they even recognize what I'm eating. And in many homes, I don't think their great-grandfathers would recognize what, what that stuff, that food-like substance is that, mm -hmm. that, that's talked about. But the thing is, buy your food from farmer's markets. Or if you can, grow your own. That's even better. But know your farmer. That's a very important principle, as you, I'm sure you talk about, that you want to have a relationship with that individual and get to know how are they feeding the soil, how are they feeding the plants, and how are they feeding the animals. Because it matters. And it's important to understand that there's a difference between grass-fed butter and grain-fed butter and canola oil and Crisco. They're not mm -hmm. the same thing, even though they're all fat. And so we need to have that kind of rigor about understanding the simplicity of real food, but the importance of, of real food. And I think it's the other thing that I would 
emphasize is that, yeah, there is an orchestra of minerals. And people love to talk about the, the 92 minerals, or maybe it's 84, what, depending upon what paradigm you're working from. But if you've ever been to a, a symphony, before the conductor comes out, the musicians are warming up, and, they're, and it's called a cacophony, right? It's just a mm -hmm. bunch of noise as they all try to tune up their, their instrument. And then the moment comes when the conductor comes out, gets up on the podium, and taps the, the podium, and then there's silence. And then, with a stroke of his arms in the baton, suddenly there's beautiful music. I would contend that the conductor of the body is copper, and that the first violinist is magnesium. There is a pecking order in minerals. And who are the clanging symbols? That's iron. But we can't live without iron, but it's got to be introduced at the right time. And so it's a different way of thinking about it. And there are a lot of musicians on a stage, but there's perfect order because there's a score that they work from. And I think our body has that score. There's an, an internal blueprint about how our body is supposed to work. And that's the score that the minerals read. But they read it at the direction of the conductor who is providing energy. He's also clearing exhaust and He's making sure that the body has the natural ability to combat enemies. So people need to, they need to think that again, this paradigm shift needs to come to realize, wow, I had no idea who the conductor was. And as it relates to the, the food itself, again, uh, I would encourage people to spend more time with bee pollen and real vitamin C and grass-fed beef liver and organ meats in general. Again, our ancestors used to eat organ meats, and they threw the muscle meats to the dogs. Now we're in a very sophisticated society where we eat muscle meats, and we throw the organ meats to the dogs. That doesn't make sense. That's where all, Think of the amount of mitochondria. Maybe your listeners don't know this. Um, the average, how many mitochondria on your t-shirt? What is that, three? three uh, it's just one big one. With one the, big that's one, okay. supposed to be the inside. That, uh, okay, yeah. got it. Okay, so that's one big. So the average cell in our body has 500 mitochondria. The average liver cell has 2,000 mitochondria. Kidney cell, 4,000 mitochondria. Heart cell, 10,000 mitochondria. What may surprise the female listeners is the average mature egg cell in their body has 600,000 mitochondria. And for those who are familiar with the term Parkinson's disease, it involves a brain region called the substantia nigra. The neurons in the substantia nigra have 2 million mitochondria. The average person doesn't know that. The average doctor doesn't know that. Well, that means there's a tremendous concentration of copper in those areas of the body. And so it's no surprise that organ meats are better for you because the organs are engaged in activity and directing activity. And that takes ATP to do that. And so there's going to be a lot of benefit that's derived from having that kind of food. And I think the overall thing is avoid the simple carbs, go to the more complex carbs, obviously. Be very mindful of the importance of minerals in your water. Don't drink hungry water, which is RO water or distilled water. You want to be mineralizing that water. And you want to be getting your, your vitamins and nutrients in your food wherever possible, because that's the way Mother Nature intended it to be. And that's really what the premise of the, of the protocol is about. Yeah, this is speaking my language. That's We're all on the same page here. Maybe we went off track with the vitamin D paradigm, but I, I kind of understand it more. But um, we're on the same page. You just have to get these nutrient-dense foods from the real sources our ancestors did. And that leads me to my last kind of question about seafood. So there's a lot of copper and oysters and seafood. So that's, that's great. And you were talking about Parkinson's and the brain and what goes wrong or neurons, then right, what goes wrong with all these mitochondria? Maybe you can talk about that and also just brain development. I guess I'll give you a two-parter because I interviewed a few great researchers talking about omega-3 and DHA and brain development and eating uh, a lot of seafood throughout human evolution or shore-based you know, evolution. We're always around collecting mussels and oysters and seafoods and, and how important it was to the brain. So maybe you could tie that all together and then the lack of function of the brain in Parkinson's. Yeah. So again, the seafood is very important. 
as you note, copper is there. The other important nutrient in brain development, it isn't just omega-3s, it's retinol. You can do the research, you know, fetal brain development, retinol deficiency, and there's some pretty scary research there. And most women who are pregnant are eating a low-fat diet, and they don't realize how important retinol is to that uh, growing baby, but also how important it is <clears throat> for the mother. And if the mother intends to breastfeed, she better be taking in copious amounts of, of retinol. Very, very important. We should stop for a second because there's two different forms. Retinol is the bioavailable form, and then there's a precursor, which is plant form of retinol that most people don't understand the difference. Right. So retinol is the animal-based. It's already preformed. And then you're talking about beta carotene, which is the precursor. It takes 12 beta carotene to equal one retinol equivalency. You got to eat a room full of carrots to equal what you would get from a couple of tablespoons of cod liver oil. Most people don't know that. And so Dr. Price was studying the importance of nutrients, but especially the importance of the animal-based form of retinol. And when I talk about fat, I'm using it as a, an acronym for from animal tissue. I think it's very important to get that pre-formed form of retinol. It's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly important for making copper bioavailable in the body. And maybe that'll be a, a conversation for a future exchange. But the central need for these nutrients that are especially found in seafood, very, very important. And I think that what Dr. Price also talked about was how civilizations would make sure that the, the newlyweds were eating these really nutrient-dense foods in order to ensure the best viability for their offspring. And that's a concept that's lost on society as well. And so it isn't just omega-3s. I think it's nutrient density, but particular emphasis on key minerals and also retinol. The issue, and I think what's tragic about pregnancy today or, or obstetrics in general, is there's an obsession over iron and vitamin D and there's no consideration about retinol and copper because they work, they work in tandem with each other. A and D, copper and iron. And modern medicine is obsessed with this. Modern medicine doesn't know what these are. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a particularly important problem. And if, if a mother intends to breastfeed her child, retinol is incredibly important there. And at the end of breastfeeding, that woman is retinol deficient. After 12 to 18 months of breastfeeding, they are going to be completely expended. So they need to understand that. As it relates to neurodegeneration in general, but Parkinson's in particular, all sorts of conflicting theories. Oh, I think it's aluminum. Oh, I think it's copper building up. Oh, it's the copper pipes that I'm licking. And it's like, oh, there's so many silly ideas out there. At the end of the day, if the mitochondria can't make energy, the neurons don't work. It is so basic. The mitochondria are just like the cylinders in our car engine. They've got to keep moving. They've got to keep pumping. They've got to keep making ATP. In that region of the brain called the substantia nigra, it's dark. It's black. Oh, wow. Maybe that melanin thing is really important. Oh, maybe tyrosinase is involved. Of course, there's involvement there because copper is instrumental in the function of the substantia nigra. And so... Back in the 70s, they wanted to really study what is this thing called Parkinson's. Turns out there's 990,000, give or take a few, 990,000 neurons in the substantia nigra. Okay, that's a lot. And each one of them has 2 million mitochondria. So that's a big number. 990,000 times 2 million. It's a really big number. And Parkinson's is when 66% of them are not working. That's the technical clinical definition of Parkinson's. And it's all about energy. It's all about iron accumulation. And the, the best research on Parkinson's is all about how lack of copper causes mitochondria to falter, which causes iron to build in the tissue. Again, the mitochondria are supposed to be recycling this iron. Very elegant mechanisms to get the iron back into use as iron sulfur clusters and as heme. And if that can't happen, it starts to accumulate in the, in the mitochondria and then they die. 
again, they become so rusted out, they can't do anything. And when it happens over the course of a lifetime, and the absolutely fascinating part, Brian, is why do some people get Parkinson's and other people get multiple sclerosis and other people get heart disease and other people get rheumatoid arthritis? That's the mystery. I think there's an energetic component to it. I think it's where we put our energy, and that's the work of Louise Hay and Bruce Lipton and people of that stature who are really recognizing that we're energy and light beings. That's a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. But there is energy, and there's different levels of energy around different parts of our body. And it just begins to raise all sorts of questions about the experiences that we've had throughout life, the emotional traumas that we might have had, the food stress, the whatever stress, and it begins to affect different parts of the body. And where we have vulnerability because of our ancestors is also a factor. Again, it's not that that genes drive this process, but genes are a reflection of the energy. And so we know that it's not genetics. It's actually epigenetics that rules genes, the environment that they find themselves in. And what is epigenetics? It's just another way of saying energetics. And when the body is under stress and it can't produce enough energy, it's going to affect gene expression. And if you have a disposition, then I think that becomes a a contributing factor. So that the Parkinson's is, it's a significant chronic condition, but it is born of energy deficiency, which is exactly what Douglas Wallace was talking about in his uh, very important article from 2005, that this concept of energy loss isn't properly understood and isn't properly guiding the thinking of practitioners, whether they're functional or conventional, because they've they've just not been trained in that. And if more people wore t-shirts like yours and knew how important the Mm -hmm. mitochondria were, I think they would go about their diet differently. They would respond to stress differently. They would stop worrying about their conditions. They think it would just have a profound effect on, on them recognizing that, that Béchamp, talking about uh, the field, uh, really understood what the driver of our, our uh, metabolism is. And at the end of the day, it comes down to eating real fuel, real food, and having access to sunlight and having practices in our day to minimize our stress or bleed off our stress through exercise or meditation or modality you might engage in and realize that the body does get out of balance. I regularly tell people they're not broken. You're just out of balance. And the body has incredible mechanisms to bring back balance and bring back what's called homeostasis. And it's right back to Einstein, E equals MC squared. That was his way of saying homeostasis. That was the elegance of his uh, discovery back in 1905. And we just need to recognize that our our cells understand E equals MC squared. They really do. We just need to eat a healthy diet, both a food diet and an emotional diet, and be, be willing to make appropriate changes in our routine to maintain the homeostasis that we seek. I love it. That's a good wrap up. And I'm glad I wore this shirt. I didn't plan it, but uh, <laughs> that was very appropriate. It was, it was pure genius, Brian. <laughs> I think so. Maybe deep down, I realized uh, that I need to put this. I mean, I put it on last night, really. I slept in this shirt. So uh, who knows? <laughs> I have to find out where you got it because that's. A, I'm going to have to steal that one. Oh, once. yeah. I'll let you know. And yeah, I guess my closing words is, I guess, get that copper. I mean, it sounds like all the things that I always talk about just how to live a, I call it sapien diet and lifestyle. It's all the things you're saying. And you're just saying all these things come down to it. You're doing the right thing to basically get your copper right and your magnesium. And this, is that kind of what you're saying? It's like all these things, the base level is what's happening. At the base level, people don't realize how important minerals are. And they don't realize how important these vitamin complexes are. Stuff coming out of a supplement bottle, not good. Stuff coming out of real food, coming from a farm where you know the farmer, it's amazing what it does. And I think what the root cause protocol does is introduce in a very selective way, how do we further support your access to minerals? How do we further ensure that you're getting the vitamin complexes that you need beyond your healthy diet? And when 
when you begin to understand what the conductor of the body does, this copper, it's magical, but it's not easily found on the internet, for sure. But if you know the right questions to ask of Dr. Google, there's treasure troves full of information that will begin to reveal the unbelievable importance of bioavailable copper to run and regulate the human physiology. It's absolutely amazing. And I, for the listeners, I teach a course. It's called the Root Cause Protocol Institute. And it's a 14-week course that people might have an interest in. And it just goes into a lot more detail so people can really understand how all these gears mesh together in terms of how the body really works. Well, it's great. Is that also at rcp123.org? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. go there and grab the guide. And thanks so much. You know, maybe we can talk again sometime. Yeah, I look forward to that. A lot of fun. And I think you have a, a very special understanding of the foundation. And what I'm trying to do is tweak it so people realize that there's some components that have been kind of lost in the shuffle in the um, in mainstream uh, discourse. I like it. Yeah, reframing this and always uncovering new things is what I'm trying to do. And good times. Um, thanks so much. And I'll talk to you again sometime. That's great. Thanks so much, Brian. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for sharing with a friend. Thanks for giving a review on iTunes or any podcast app. We can't do it without people sharing and giving it good reviews on iTunes. So it's free. Just open up any podcast app, especially the Apple podcast app and give it a review. This is valuable information that I spend hours making and do it for free. So please support me can also support me and my companies. We have a few good people working together to make this happen. It's all handmade, all humanely raised, all stuff we believe in, all good in all the ways. That's nosetail.org and of course, sapien.org, where you can get the program and the tribe to support us even further and change your life with the program and be part of the tribe to continue your lifestyle habits. So till next week, we'll have one more with Rob Wolf before Christmas. Look forward to that one. Oh man, that was good. We spent some time getting into some things. Thanks everyone. Thanks.